hope, joy, peace, forgiveness. These are the gifts from God to all who have found Jesus and actively choose to follow him. But following Jesus is not simply about receiving. There is so much more. The hope and joy we have in Jesus is the remedy for the world's hopelessness and despair. The peace we have comes not from peaceful circumstances, but from the Prince of Peace, who works in and through the hurt, confusion, and sadness in life. And our forgiveness undeserved spurs us to freely offer forgiveness to those in our lives. Jesus gave absolutely everything for us to receive these gifts. And that is precisely what he asks of those who take up the call and follow him. Everything. Well, I am thankful that you came tonight to celebrate with us and worship and remember and also to hear from God's word. So we're continuing our series, as Nicoma said, walking through the Gospel of Luke and sharing, first of all, as we take a look at this, is the teachings of Jesus to his followers. So many of you tonight are followers of Jesus. Some of you are wondering what that's about. So these are the instructions that Jesus gives, and we want to look at these. And there's a point in his ministry where he had the followers around, he's teaching them, and then he gets a place where he says, it's time for you to go and do this. Time for you to grow up, experience, stretch your legs, and try it out and do these things. And that's what we're going to look at tonight in Luke chapter 9. And we have those times in our life when we're learning, we're studying, and then you've got to take that book knowledge and you've got to put it into practice. One of those times in our lives that we do that is learning how to drive. Now, some of you remember way back when, some of you are looking forward to the time when you will. When I grew up in Illinois, it was required you had to take a class in school to learn how to drive, and that's where you were taught the basics of driving. And come to Missouri, found out you didn't have to take that class, you could just do it on your own. And it was one of those fun experiences as a parent to teach your child to drive. And so we got to do that, so here studying the book, learning and getting the car, and our son, it was kind of fun to do that. Our daughter, it was just an experience. So, Joy, I'm telling on you now. So it was an experience, and we went to the uh, school parking lot, so it was big and wide open. That's a good place to start. And she didn't quite understand the difference between easing the gas pedal or hitting the gas pedal. Or the same thing with the brake. And it was literally, and, and I thought I was going to get whiplash, just hitting forward and back. And, and we both ended up just laughing, and I wish, like everything, we had a video of that time. It was just a fun, fun experience. I'm glad I never had to go through that again with another child. But what, there's a difference between learning it and doing it, correct? Sure, we know that. Sometimes it's easy. Sometimes you just get out there and you go, whoa, what am I doing? Sometimes you learn that with some project you're doing at school. It's easy to do it, but boy, when you're up there in front of everybody else, it's hard. Maybe you learn that at your work. I can do that. I can do that. And then when you're doing it, it's a little bit scary, a little bit frightening. And we have that same little scenario with Jesus and his disciples. Of course, what they're doing is of utmost importance because it's sharing the word of God and the message of hope. So Luke chapter 9. Look at the first couple verses. When Jesus had called the 12 together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Now, Jesus is directly with his followers, these 12 men he worked with. Another, verse, or another uh, gospel tells us he actually sent them out in twos. So it was two by two by two. He sent them out, divide them up, said, you two, you go this way. You two, go this way. Now, Jesus is Messiah. He gave these guys particular some extra powers and ability so they would know that they were being sent by Messiah. And what they were doing was teaching, preaching the kingdom of God. Kingdom of God is one of those phrases that says, Jesus is here. Messiah has come. We're into this time period in this relationship with God when we can see and understand that it doesn't start just when we get to heaven. It begins now as we build a relationship with him. So as they went out, it was there. And he is saying, you guys, you be intentional about sharing the good news of the kingdom. 
And that's something that's not just for them, but it's for us as well. As followers of Jesus, we're to be intentional. We're to go out intentionally sharing wherever we go who Jesus is. Now, sometimes people go out and they'll share the good news about Jesus, but it doesn't sound very good. They go out condemning and mean-spirited and pointing out evil and pointing out wrong. Now, Jesus had a way of confronting evil, but he did it with the love and the hope of the grace of Jesus Christ, of the hope of the gospel. So they shared, and they did it. They were intentional about wherever they go. As followers, we need to be intentional about sharing the kingdom of God. It just, just makes sense. Verse 3, he told them, Jesus told them, take nothing for the journey, no staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra tunic. It's one of those unique things, he tells them. He says, when you go out, you just go out as who you are. Go out, in some ways it sounded like they were unprepared. They were just to go and they were just to do it. No supplies. He wanted them to depend upon him for everything they were doing. He wanted them to go out. In some ways they were a little bit nervous, unsure how this is going to be working. But he wanted them to go out depending on totally upon him. We say he intentionally wanted them to trust him more. Just to trust God more in every part of their life. And it goes on from there. It talks about what they did when they would go to one house. And if they go in and that place wouldn't receive them, they'd really shake the dust off. They'd go to the next one. And they go. They would just go and share and do whatever they could. It was a few years back, we went on a missions trip with Marcus Pearson down in Nicaragua. It's one of those great places you fly into Managua. And then we took a very tiny plane, flew to the coast, and we got in this little boat, and we went down the ocean and then went up into a river, and he's trying to reach out to these mesquite villages. And he says, we're going to go to a new place he's never been before. So we go in, and we literally landed the boat next to a dugout canoe. We're way up in the river, and we prayed, God, if this is the place we're supposed to be, open the doors for us. And we prayed while he went into the village with a man who could speak mesquite. And he, and he said, can we stay here? Can we share with you? And he said, if I come back and they say no, we will go upriver to another place they'll receive us. If not, we will stay. And they welcomed us. And we went in and we, we stayed with them and we ate with them. And we had a generator and we shared the Jesus film. And it was a great experience. It reminded me of this passage. That you're just going to go and see what's there. Now, it doesn't mean we have to go to the remote villages of Nicaragua. It means you go to your school. It means you go to your neighborhood. It goes where you work. And you find those who are friendly, those who are open to hear the gospel and to share the kingdom of God, and you express that wherever you go, and that's what they did. But they did it uniquely. They did it without any of the extra stuff that you want for comfort. They, would, they did it without any extra supplies, without any food. They just went truly trusting, depending upon God. Now, when we were first married... We got married when we were in college, and we didn't have much of anything, and we were finishing up one year of school, and a friend of mine told me about this uh, camping trip he was going on, and he said, Doyle, it's a week-long trip. You and Gene should go with us. It's going to be great, and the music to my ears, as he said, it's a free week. They supply everything that you need. And I said, Hi, I've not been camping. I don't have backpack and tents. He goes, you don't need anything. All you have to do is bring a sleeping bag. That's all. You, they provide everything. So did we go? Sure, I tell Jean about it. She's going, that's fun. Sure, we'll do that. So we get there. The first thing we do is we get, and they have all this stuff sitting out. There's no tents, but there's, a, there's some plastic over here. There's some ropes, and there's bags of food that we had no idea what it was. It was a lot of freeze-dried stuff, and there's some cans over here and some stuff. And he said, we said, what are we supposed to take? He goes, I don't care. Take what you want. Don't take any of it. It doesn't matter. It's whatever you guys want. Well, towards the end of the week, we found out that it was called stress camp that we were a part of. And it was stressful, but it was still fun. So Jean, being the prepared person she is, she goes, I think we should take it all. And I go, I don't think we need any of this stuff. It doesn't really matter. Smart thing, I'm married to my wife. So we pack it up. That little plastic tent turned out to be our tent, uh, that plastic piece piece of plastic. All those things were there, and it was very helpful. But as we go along, we, we had our first experience of rappelling and rock climbing and all those great things and trust falls. You've all done the trust fall and all those things you do. Well, at the end of the week, towards it, he said, okay, take what you want. However, don't bring any food this time. But we're just going to go out, and you're going to stay a while, and we'll come back and get you. So what should we take? He goes, whatever you want. And by that time, I learned that means you better take it. So he took, his out. he took his out literally one at a time. He took me to this area, and he'd say, over here, Doyle, this is your part of the woods. Don't cross this boundary. Don't cross this boundary. That one, this is your area. It's a large area. You stay here until we come back and get you. 
They took Gene, they took all of us individually, had no idea where everybody else was at, and do you know how long we were there? Then they come back till the end of the next day. It's a long time, but what do you do during that time? You sleep a little bit, you hear weird noises all night long by yourself, but you prayed, you contemplated, you figured it out, and it was a great experience, the whole week was. It was for both of us, Gene liked it too, by the way. It was just one of those neat things. When you get away, you sit back, and without all the stuff, without all the supplies, and you trust God, and you pray, and I'm not saying you all should go do a week like that, but you should do a day like that. You should do a time when you get away from your stuff, get away from all of it, and say, God, I need to trust you. Now, it's interesting, towards the end of this, this book, in Luke chapter 22, Jesus is talking to these same guys, and he's saying, remember that time that I sent you out without any stuff and how you had to trust me? He says, don't forget that, as he sent them out again. Now, the next time, he didn't tell them, don't leave, you leave everything behind. But this was clearly a learning experience for them. He said, you learn to trust me, and later you remember how you trusted and you remember how I provided for you, because Jesus did now, the next few verses, it goes on to the place down to verse number seven that kind of interrupts the story. Here's the disciples. They're going out. They're sharing. They come back. And then it says, Herod the Tetrarch kind of switches gears. Talking about Herod. Herod heard about these people and what was going on. They heard about Jesus. And Herod says he, he wondered who this Jesus was. And he says, maybe he's John the Baptist that's come back from the dead. Now, last weekend, we talked about the confusion of what was going on. John was killed while he was in prison. He says, maybe John the Baptist come back, or maybe it's Elijah, or one of the prophets. And Herod was real curious because he had heard about these things. He says, I want to meet him. I think, how did Herod hear about Jesus? This nobody in the land. Go back to chapter 4, chapter 8, verse 3. It talks about a lady named Joanna, who's a follower of Jesus. It says she's married to Cusa, who happens to be the man manager of Herod's household. So husband and wife are going to be talking He's telling him what's going on, and here this inroad gets back in, and Herod says, I, I, I'm curious about Jesus. Not sure of his motives, but end up at the trial of Jesus. He meets him face to face, and he has the opportunity to receive and accept Jesus. Of course, he does not. So you have this little story about Herod, and then it gets down to the place where after all this, the apostles return, they get together, they go off to Bethsaida to get off by themselves. All the people are there, and that's where Nicomus read our story earlier. They gather together, Jesus begins teaching them. They teach all day long, and the people are getting tired, but they're just loving Jesus' teaching. They don't leave, and the disciples say, we've got a problem here. And the problem is they're hungry, and there's a lot of them. Look at verse number 13. Jesus replied, you give them something to eat. And they answered, we only have five loaves of bread and two fish unless we go and buy food for all this crowd here. And the next verse says there's 5,000 men, not counting the women and children, so at least 15,000 people are there. It says, what do we do with them? Now, before Jesus said, you feed them, verse before it, these guys come to Jesus and say, Jesus, look at all these people. They're tired, they're hungry, they need a place to say, you need to send them away. You need to go get them somewhere else so they can go do this. That wasn't a very good solution in Jesus' mind. Sometimes we see a problem and our solution is they need to go take care of that themselves or someone else should take care of this. Jesus' response, you take care of this. You provide for them. You need, you need to take care of what it is. So another little step we'll take here is that we need to be intentional to engage in service. Now, that's one of the phrases we use around here a lot. To look at the need in front of you and say, what are you going to do about it? Now, as a church, when we use this phrase, engage in service, we use it to mean different things. We mean it to be that we need to engage in the serving the church body and who we are. We also need to be serving the people in our city around us, and we also need to be serving people around the world. Some of you were part of the B1 conference the last couple of days, and you were reminded that that service begins at your home and serving one another, especially husbands and wives honoring each other. But we all have different areas of passion. Some of you 
express that in different ways. And Dave and I were talking about it last night. Some people are, are passionate about what's going on in Nicaragua and other parts of the world. And you really express it strong there. Some of you are so engaged in different parts of the city that you express God's love in those areas. Some of you, it's here, but we have the responsibility to do all of them. It doesn't do any good if I just do it on my missions trip to Nicaragua and I ignore people's needs all around me here. So wherever we're at, wherever we're going, living out this passion of engaging in service and connecting people. Now the disciples, they obviously had some concern because they said it's getting late in the day. They said the people need to eat. They need to have a place to stay. To have concern is good. Now they may have just been thinking, oh, Look at all these people. Do you know how much it costs to feed all these people? That may have been their motive. Or maybe they were genuinely concerned that we need to provide some food for them. But they, Jesus saw a little bit differently. They saw there's a need. Send them away to go take care of it. Jesus saw this need, and he cared in a whole different way. Now, it's unique, this gospel story, this miracle, the feeding of the 5,000, Besides the resurrection of Jesus, this is the only miracle of Jesus that's included in all four Gospels. It's considered pretty important for a reason. If you go back to Mark, we see him speaking into this in a different way. Mark chapter, uh, let me find it here, Mark chapter 6, verse 34, says, When Jesus landed and saw the crowd, he had what? Compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And so he began teaching them many things. So when Jesus saw these people, it wasn't just he saw, oh, they're hungry or they need a place to stay. He had compassion. He loved them. He was concerned about them. When John tells this story, John adds a little bit more to it from a different perspective. And it says that when Jesus said, you go feed them, the disciples said, the only thing we've got here is one little boy has these five loaves and these two fish. That's all we've got. So it brings in a unique story that one boy brought that. So you think of all those people, I think that's kind of funny. Of all those people that came to go hear Jesus, that only one person came prepared to stay for a while, and it was a kid. I don't know if he was the only one in the room, but I, I assume they thought they were just going about their day, and Jesus over here, they just flocked to go hear him. They didn't plan on staying as long as they did. And I don't know if the boy was so bright, maybe he was going somewhere else, maybe his mom packed him to lunch, maybe he was going to a friend's house, who knows. But this one kid comes in and he's got the food that nobody else has. Can you imagine how he must have felt when disciples say, hey, could you come up here? Jesus wants to see you. Jesus has need of your food. And when he said, can we have your food? Because literally they had his food, gave it to Jesus, and he prayed over it. I wonder if he would have reacted like maybe some of us. When someone says, can I have your food, how would you go? It's mine. Hey, I prepared. Why didn't you? It's hard for us to share. Today. But he gave it. He gave it there, and God used it in a great way. I love a, a song. It's a gospel song. Some of you may know it from back when. And, and how God used this story to bless so many people and how we come into it so many times and think, God, I don't have anything to offer you. I don't have anything significant or anything important. But how God used this little boy, the words of the song, Ordinary People, says this. Just like the little lad who gave Jesus all he had, how the multitude were fed with the fish and the loaves of bread, what you have may not seem much, but when you yield it to the touch of the master's loving hand, then you will understand how your life could never be the same. God uses ordinary people. He chooses people just like you and me who are willing to give as he commands because little becomes much as you place it in the master's hand. Are those great words? Just take the little bit that you have. So many stories in the Old Testament. There's Moses in the Old Testament who came. God said, I got this job for you to do. And he says, but my speech isn't good. I can't talk very well. I don't think I could do this. But he had to learn to trust God more. And God provided and used him in incredible ways. It's a prophet, the name of Elijah, that was a famine going on. And he needed to provide food. He didn't know what to do. But God gave him a little bit of flour from a widow. He prayed over it. And said, just start begin baking. And God took that and turned that little bit of amount that she gave and provided in a great way. Or the story of David, who was this young boy 
who came in and saw this great need, and he said, why isn't somebody doing something about this? But he stepped up, and God used him to take on the giant that was around him. There was a man named Gideon who was leading this army, and there was the enemy who was vast and huge, and God said, you know, you don't need all the people around you. And he got down to only had 300 people in his army versus this massive army, and God did a great victory. I had to learn how to trust God with the little bit that I've got, You take what little bit you have, you give it to God and say, God, I trust you. He can do incredible things and overwhelming odds around you. 2 Peter 1.3 says, God gives you everything that you need. The little bit that you have. You say, this huge need in front of me. Look at the needs around me. The needs of my work, the needs of my community, the needs of my school. They're so big and God needs to send someone else to take care of this. Well, maybe you're the person that he wants to do, and you say, I don't have enough. That's, you're in great company with all kinds of people in the Bible. But you got the power of the Holy Spirit and God in your life to make a difference. One definition of compassion is this. Being moved to use whatever you have to meet a need. Whatever you've got, you're gonna meet this need, but you're being moved from the inside. It's one thing as those apostles had concern for people that needed food. It's a different thing to be moved internally by God's grace and God's love to say, we must do something about this and be moved out of concern and love for them. As followers of Jesus, we need to be intentional about wanting to bless people with the message of the kingdom of God. Reaching out and saying, how can God bless you? And what can I do to be a part of this? How can I do this? Not just saying, go take care of yourself, but how can I be a part of bringing compassion to you? You should be a person that shows compassion at all times, wherever you're at, because you're concerned. Engage in service, one of the ways we use is that, is that you're gonna meet the needs of people. You see a need, well, let's be a part of meeting that need, but you do it with compassion in your heart and care. It's a spiritual marker. Did you see the need? Are you desired to meet that need out of love? Not guilt, but out of love. I love the stories told about Colonel Sanders. Now, you may know him as the guy that started KFC, and it sounded like he was an incredible man. Not only a great businessman with a, and a, knew how to cook chicken really well, but he also was a man with had care and a follower of Jesus. Stories told about him on an airplane, and he got on the plane, and there was this baby that was started crying on the plane and fussing. You've been on the plane like that? And the baby was just fussing, upset. The young parents were doing everything they could to calm the child, and they couldn't do it. And the flight attendants were trying to help, and it was just really bad, and people around were getting really irritated. And he finally went up, got up, and said, would you mind, could I just hold your baby for a little bit? And that kind, gentle spirit that he had, he took that baby and sat down, and his calmness just calmed that baby down, and everything was good, and went to sleep. And it was just one of those nice, sweet moments. As they were getting off a plane, a man came up to him and said, thank you so much for what you did for all of us on the plane. And Colonel Sanders said, I didn't do that for you. I did it for the baby. (laughs) And sometimes our motives for meeting a need are a little bit self-serving. Is it to really care about the person and the need of this individual and how can we help them? Or are we concerned about the image and the look of everybody else and getting rid of the problem for the comfort of everybody else? Those other areas are good. There's some concern there, but it's different than being motivated by compassion. By motivating, motivated to see a person who's really hurting and struggling and say, I want to be a part of meeting this need. Let's read a couple of verses so we can just kind of apply this to our lives and what compassion is. First of all, from 1 John. Would you read this aloud with me? If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? It's a strong verse. So just a few areas where we need to have compassion. One is just this area of material needs. When you see someone with some needs around you materially, how do you respond? Do you respond by saying, hey, I've got a little bit of food. I've got fish and bread. Can I share that with you? Or do we respond with, well, what did you do to get yourself in that spot? You did something wrong. You should be working hard. You should be doing better. There's something wrong with you. And maybe the person didn't make some bad decisions. But do you have compassion for that person? Or you just write them off and say, you don't care? I'm thankful that as a church, we have this incredible benevolence program. 
that we've been part of for a long time. And you gave so generously back in November to a special offering. And a team cares and reaches out, provide. And that's a great thing. And we have this great food pantry, which we ask when you leave today, take one of those bags and fill it up and bring it back next weekend. Those opportunities we have to care for and love on people that demonstrates love. But sometimes something's a little bit wrong if we just say, if you see someone with a need and you go, oh, yeah, go to that church. They'll help you. They'll do it. And nothing is stirred in your heart yourself. We have this great program as a church, but every single person in this room needs to have a, a little benevolence program going on yourself. Maybe when there's a person in need, you need to bring them to the church, but maybe you need to demonstrate a care and a love and do something for them yourself individually. The reason why you see that need is because God puts you in that relationship to see them that you can make the first step. And then you can introduce them to a church, a whole body of believers that loves and cares for as well. Heard about a family that carries, always carries some, some energy bars and some food in their car with them. So when you drive along the road, you see someone needing some food. You've got it right there. You're ready to help that person. They always keep a 5 or $10 bill. They're always ready to help a person. Instead of just saying, what, what's your problem? What did you do to get here? What's your, and all those things, the concern that you might have. But are you moved by compassion to say, I want to make a difference? Wouldn't that be great? If the few thousand people that attend here every weekend were reaching out with love and compassion to people with needs individually and we all do it together. And Chris, would you go back to that verse? I want us to read that verse again from 1 John. Would you read it again? If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need and has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in them? We receive God's love and God's grace. That should make a difference. Amen? When you see a need, we should help out. So one area of compassion is that material needs. Another area, let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3. It's a longer passage. It says, praise be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion, and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our troubles. So would you read this with me? So that we cannot, we can comfort those in trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. So as God of compassion, this God of comfort that we sang about earlier in the service, we sang, Jesus, Jesus, you care about our needs and we praise him. God, look how much you love me. If we're following that God and worshiping and receiving that in life, then how can we not take this same comfort, the same love, and we reach out to others who are going through difficult times and others who are having troubles. So another area of compassion is we minister to those with troubles. Those people just going through these difficult times. And you recognize, well, they are all messed up. They got so many issues. They're so down. They're so discouraged. Well, instead of just being frustrated with them, we should be moved with compassion the same way Jesus does and say, I care about these people that are going through troubles. It's not limited to people because of how they got there. We all have those seasons of our life when we go through a lot of difficulties and struggles and troubles in our life, and God's love is there for us no matter what. Amen? We're so thankful for his love is there. Well, followers of Jesus need to be expressing that, expressing that compassion to people who are going through those troubles as well. Letting them know God cares about them and reaching out to them. One more verse, Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 32, would you read this one aloud with me? Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. So what are we supposed to be doing? Forgiving the same way God forgives us. So that compassion, giving forgiveness to people who are hurting and struggling. Wonderful thing about grace is it's undeserved. You don't deserve grace from God. I don't, but he gives it to us anyway. The people around you that are struggling, that are going through these incredibly difficult times, you say they don't deserve forgiveness because look how they got to where they did. But that's what grace is all about. He says, as a follower of Jesus, you forgive. You release them from what is owed because of God's love for you. As followers of Jesus, we should not be these embittered people, resentful, retaliatory, getting back, no matter how it's been done. But we should be a people that are giving grace, and we do it how? Out of compassion. 
Because you learn to love the same way that God loves us. It's learning to ask, how can I help this person? How can I help this circumstance? However they got there, well, how can I do it to make a difference? So the next time you see a need, instead of just saying, somebody needs to do something about this, Jesus, you need to send these people. Jesus, you need to send someone else. I need to get someone else. How about the first answer is, wow, look at this need. God, what would you like for me to do? Am I the person that should reach out and to respond? And wherever you're at in life, what should you do? And then you reach out to others and say, come along with me and help us meet this need together. There's no boundaries for compassion. Compassion always gives. You think, well, what if I run out? You'll never run out because God continually gives you his love and his grace. The first place to start with that is right where you're at, right at home, caring for. There's people with difficult circumstances. Well, one of those is to care about them. Yesterday, Pat, you shared with us and reminded us, even in our marriages around us, to listen to people's stories. Ask them some questions. So before you dump, jump to a judgment, about the troubles in their life or the physical needs that they may have or the issues that are going on and the bitterness that's there, maybe you should ask them their story. Learn more about them. And then learn to love the same way Jesus loves us. For some of you, it's actually easy to love people. It's actually easy to reach out and go, oh, we just need to do something for them. So share that compassion. For others of you, it's just not. Maybe it's because of your past, because of where you're at. Maybe you're like the disciples that just run to those other issues. But can you just pray that God will move you to the place? And you just decide, I am going to do an act of compassion, whether it's motivated by the right way or not. I'm just going to start doing these things. And you know when you do that? You just open your heart up and God's grace begins to flow through you in a stronger way. We should be able to do whatever is needed and use whatever you have to show compassion, the love of Christ to others. One more verse, and we'll end with this. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 says this. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion. So I'd like for you to do this in the morning. Do this one other time. When you get up and get, in the, get dressed tomorrow morning, as you look in the mirror, you're putting on the clothes, can you just put on one extra piece? Put on another, one more thing. Put on compassion. Lily, just say, God, I don't, maybe it's, I don't feel like this. I'm tired. I dread going to work today. I dread this relationship. I dread going to school. I'm scared about what's going to happen. And say, God, I'm just going to put on your compassion today. And help me to wear it well. Because it's God's compassion you're wearing. Not just in of yourself. You get the presence of God in your life and say, God, help them this love and this grace to come out with compassion. So when you see the people who are out there who are hungry, who need something else, don't be the disciples and say, they need to go get some help somewhere and send them down the road. But you listen to Jesus and say, you do something about this. And it begins by loving, by caring, and expressing God's love for them. Compassion, being moved to use whatever you have to meet the need. See that need? There's needs all around you. Now, we can't fix all of them, but we can sure make a difference with God's love. And I'm grateful for the difference that you've made in my life and the lives of everybody in this room who knows you. And God, we ask that you would move us and transform our hearts so that we would love and look more like you every day. And Father, if people in this room are in some, some are in some great struggles and difficulties right now, and I pray that you would meet those needs, use us as a body of believers to come around tonight and love each other. Father, I pray that all of us, no matter if we're hurting or we're doing great in a season of life, but we'd each be moved with compassion to care for others around us. I pray that it would make a difference in our homes, make a difference in our schools, make a difference where we work, that maybe in a very hard, difficult area, there would be a bright spot of your love showing up in each one of us. And in relationships, and Father, with strangers that we meet as we're going down the road or in stores, I pray that we would see people the way you do. And I pray that throughout this week, there'll just be many, many victories 
as compassion shines over a world that's full of dark. Father, would you just move in our hearts now, help us to see and understand. I pray that your love would be strong in this room. Each of us would sense your love, compassion for us, and that would motivate us to honor you. We love you. It's in Jesus' name.